Hello and welcome back to the podcast. We have Daniel Swain with us today, who is the owner of Chase Cricket. He has a fascinating backstory where he started off his journey at the Ministry of Defence as an engineer and worked there for seven years. He then went on to work at Chase Cricket under former England cricketer Robin Smith before acquiring the business from him. The Chase brand has gone from strength to strength since then and it is a pleasure to have him alongside me today to discuss his journey. Should be an excellent listen and hope you enjoy the podcast. So Daniel, thank you for coming in today and tell us a bit about yourself, about your journey and quite a big career jump from MOD engineer to a cricket bat maker. How did that come about? Yeah, slightly. Bit of a bit of a change in career path. But um basically my going way back from, from leaving school, uh, I left school with not a huge amount of GCSE qualifications and did a first diploma in engineering at Basingstoke Technical College. And then once I'd finished that the course at Basingstoke Tech, I basically found an advert in in a paid newspaper asking for apprentices at Aldermaston and Farnborough. So I applied at the Atomic Weapons Establishment Aldermaston and also at Farnborough and I got into both but I chose to go into the Atomic Weapons Establishment at Aldermaston and studied engineering, mechanical engineering. So I worked on some pretty complex machines like five axes CNC machines which were very modern back then. So that would have been sort of mid mid nineties and then up into the two thousand I think I left in two 2002 to go traveling came back from traveling and didn't really know what to get back into because engineering had engineering at the time although it's getting a lot better at the moment there wasn't a huge amount of jobs going so met robin smith actually in a in a pub strangely enough and then um yeah he offered me a, a weekend job which i did and then worked to him worked for him from 2004 to about just before 2006 and then bought the company from robin in 2007 back in the day we weren't fully making the bats from from scratch and that was my main passion so you know coming on board and seeing how they were doing it I wasn't hugely happy I wanted to do I always talk about full circle manufacturing so as soon as I bought the company I smashed every little piggy bank I had developed half the machines myself and bought a few more from a company down in Kent so yeah it's been um so we started truly making bats by hand you know, start of 2007 and it's, yeah, gone from strength to strength and I've moved, you know, all my ability in the engineering side of stuff. I've been able to incorporate that into setting up all the new machines and we have got a very complex shaping machine. Nothing to do with CNC machines. It's just a double-headed spindle molder, which we can do a very rough partial shape which saves us a lot of time on the bats. The The reason I've been able to do that is just through all the knowledge that I gained at, at the Atomic Weapons Establishment. So yeah, it's very, it was a very helpful apprenticeship and I've learned, learned a hell of a lot. And it's amazing how the transition between Trident nuclear warheads to making cricket bats is across is actually quite good. Not many people would see it that way. <laughs> no, 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 but it's... um. It's it's just about material removal off of a product. You know, what I used to do at Aldermaston was, you know, you'd be giving be given a piece of material and then you'd be told to machine it into off a drawing and so it's 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 quite similar apart from the cricket bats are slightly less destructive or maybe you want them to be destructive i don't know but it's um it's a nicer product to make yeah. than what i was making before obviously so but yeah it's good fun okay obviously there are a lot of people who have careers they do them not as a passion but literally just to as a livelihood they have to do them they have to go into work every day what made you take that leap of faith from having a very solid secure job to taking on something completely different in a completely different industry um just just because i could basically see the i mean people romanticize about making bats and stuff and 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 if you want to make it a commercially viable business, you can't be making one bat a day. I could see the potential within the business, you know, that it was very antiquated the way that we were finishing the bats back in the day. But I could see the potential of machining it and my my knowledge and background is fundamentally mass production. I, I'd hate to say mass production when it comes to cricket bats because we do take a lot of time still, but a lot of the time, a lot of people spend a lot of time roughing down a bat. So we can rough down a bat very quickly and spend a lot more time in the key areas. So yeah, I mean, I could just see a huge potential and we, we, we you know, it's taken quite a few years, but I'd say over the last six years, we've, we can't make our bats any better than 
than I mean, I, I dread to say, you know, we're the best bat maker in the UK, but in the back of my mind, we're pretty good. Okay, so essentially, I mean, you had a very clear plan in your head uh, when you met Robin Smith and then did your apprenticeship with him on the weekends. Is that when it kind of clicked where you saw during your apprenticeship and your weekends at Chase that you can actually take it to another level completely? Or was it even before yeah, then? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, when you say did my apprenticeship with what, as in with Chase? With Chase, yeah. Well, I mean, with Chase, I didn't even do an apprenticeship. Okay. I mean, because because the bats were not being fully made in house, it was kind of I just self taught. And also, again, the company where we we bought our splicing machine from, you know, I just took a little bit of knowledge from them, but I just wanted to learn it from scratch. So, I mean, when I when I first started I think I did about three weekends with Robin and yeah just really really enjoyed it and then you know it did it did suddenly dawn on me that this is a very antiquated business and wasn't doing very very well at the time but yeah I could just see huge potential. How old were you then? Um, I was 30. Okay. Although that does disclose my my actual age so so yeah it was just yeah I mean I don't know what we were producing back at the day you know 2004 but I'd imagine it's probably like 300 bats a year which is not something you could rely upon a Mm. good salary and you know expand and that sort of thing so within the first year we doubled it and then you know the numbers that we're doing now is 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 really really good so I'm in this industry because I genuinely love driving into work and I actually get you know there's not many people that wake up in the morning and you know I do spring out of bed it's physically very demanding even though a lot of it is automated you know there's still draw knifing and drum sanding and which is very repetitive and it's quite hard on the body but it's something I thoroughly enjoy can't see myself ever falling out of love with it and it and it's good and most importantly you know I have a family and a mortgage and want to have a way of life so you know we we had to structure it into a position where we could make it a very viable business which which it is and it's um i've always been cautious on spending i've never you know got a loan to have a huge marketing budget we don't sponsor any really high profile players that we have to spend a fortune on do you think it's worth doing that in terms of sponsoring players is it worth having high profile players in your opinion I think if you're a brand, if you're if you're not a manufacturer, I think if you're a brand like New Balance or Puma or Adidas, then I think you do have to spend good money on globally known players. Our main USP is the fact that people know that we make in the UK and a lot of people have been to the factory, not to buy, but just to come and visit um, and just to look at all the machinery and look at our processes and come and sniff the workshop, which is a lot of people do. Um, the smell of you know linseed oil and willow is a nice aroma but i i don't think we would i mean we couldn't afford to do it anyway at the moment well we couldn't afford to do it and i don't think i'd want to do it you know some of the numbers that get banded around for a bowler uh, an england bowler or an international bowler you know it's tens of thousands of pounds and it's hard to quantify it i don't know i mean i've, I've always thought that i'd quite like to give give joe root whatever he earns and give him a chase bat and i think we wouldn't be able to keep up with the demand and sp- yeah. especially in the junior areas you know junior bats pads and gloves i think you would see a huge spike and sometimes it's you know we've we've won quite a few awards in various national magazines and that sort of stuff and you know you win it and you get your 9.9 out of 10 and it's rated really highly but you go to work on the monday after the release on the saturday of that award and you you imagine everything erupting i just don't think it does i think it helps generally with your profile but yeah okay the industry you're in it's quite a specialist view to be in you no know, cricket bat making mm-hmm. essentially what sort of planning do you have in place in terms of a succession plan for the next bat maker or how can you even find the next bat maker do you have anything in pla- in place for that i mean yeah we we have seen very significant growth over particularly this year obviously 2020 was not very good but this year has been amazing so we have got further two job positions going one being a bat maker and one being like a dispatch manager but it's i mean it's quite difficult at the moment i mean the jobs market is quite flooded there's a lot of jobs out there but we would we do need another bat maker and don't need any qualifications to be a bat maker you just need a very very good eye and the ability to learn so that that's that's our sort of future expansion at the moment i'd, I'd envisage that we'll probably need another two or three bat makers okay. within the next two or three years to keep up with demand which is great and it, and it and it could be a fantastic role it's a really good environment as a as a company and as a 
company owner you know I don't chastise people for walking in at five past nine or leaving at 525 instead of 530 you know it's yeah. it's very relaxed but are there any prerequisites you would say in your experience that would really help someone looking to become a bat maker well, just the just a, a natural eye and hand hand to eye coordination. You can generally tell if somebody's going to be able to make a bat within about fifteen seconds of them working a draw knife. Okay. So when we've been looking for people just recently, we've given them we we have taken somebody on. So we have taken a new bat maker, but the three people came in for a day, and we we gave them sort of like a bit of an aptitude test all the way around all the different stations to see if they can the ability to hold a spoke shape, hold a draw knife sand and you can you know obviously making a bat is more complex than plastering a wall but i can you know i i think plasters and people like that and mm. people in the trade are like a plaster if you look at a plaster rendering and then skimming a wall it's such a knack yeah. it really is a knack you know i i can't plaster a wall but it's having that knack just mm. to be bit that it's, you need to have kind of like a fluidness about you you know you when you're making a bat you need to be able to flow you need it on the drum sanders and stuff you need to be able to you make very natural movements when you're making a bat it's, mm. it's quite an artisan way of doing stuff you know and you you need that ability yeah and you say it's quite romanticized but you've quite romanticized it right there the yeah bat making process yeah 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 it is a it is a lovely it's a lovely industry to be in and there are not many things that you can see i think globally or you know domestically in this country being made from start to finish which mm. i think people love to see as well bearing in mind we all work you know, with a lot of a lot of service industries in the uk isn't there so it's um it's nice to see something being made yeah you know yeah. I, I started my apprenticeship at the atomic weapons establishment in 1990 and even back then you know the engineering side and manufacturing in the uk was actually quite good mm. i think it was on its on its demise kind of thing but yeah it's um it's good to see yeah. And people are astounded. People are astonished when they come in and they see a cleft of wood and a cane handle and then, you know, the next thing you know it's coming out as a shiny knocked in bat. So But do you think that's a in the long term, do you think that we'll get to a stage where the whole process is automated from start to finish? No. Or will there always be a need for someone? Yeah. Something. Yeah. I I mean to be honest, I think at the moment we've got the automation is as much as we can do. It's just, I mean, you could do, but I, I, th I think for the for the cost, I'd, I'd say it's fair, fairly impossible to do it because all the hand sanding and all the boning and the shoulders and sanding of the shoulders and everything like that is it's too complex to mm. to try and do it. I think there will always be, and we, to be honest, we wouldn't really want to take it away. I think it's fairly impossible to do, and I don't think we'd ever want to take that away. Yeah, because that's the that's the area that's key. And even if you could automate it a little bit more, you'd still probably be finishing it by hand just to double check. Yeah. In terms of the demands of cricket bats now in the market, obviously with the shorter formats of IPL, Big Bash, now the 100, mm -hmm. has meant there's, there's been an increase of interest and naturally that will probably mean an increase in participation levels locally. Yeah, I know globally it's, it's had a massive impact, especially something like the IPL, where demand for high quality English Willow has increased and the English Willow in general. How have you coped as a as a brand and a, as a business to that demand, or have you seen that sort of a surge in demand in let's say the last five to ten years? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the, all the different formats has has really helped with interest generally. I think the hundred this year. I think I was slightly skeptical of it. I must admit, but I think it's been brilliant. You know, I know people that have never had an interest in cricket that have gone down to the Aegeus, not even understand the rules or anything, but you know, even to have that interest in it. I think is really really good. Yeah, I mean the de the demand in product has has definitely gone up. One thing that we struggle with, we we get all our wood from or the majority of our wood from JS Wrights in Chelmsford. We have a great relationship with them, but the problem with the higher grade bats is the fact the grade ones and twos are, are not coming through. So we're getting slightly lower quality. I'm not going to say lower quality wood, but less grains in the wood. Mm. And you do generally get the higher performing bats. It's not set in stone. Sometimes you can get bats with, with wider grains and blemishes that you tap up and test with mallets and stuff. And they do go really well. I think the wood is always available. So you've always got the scope to make more products mm. with the more interest and more demand. But I think that expectation of people having 10 straight grains, absolutely perfect. Bats are going to have to be brainwashed and try to explain that it's not all about the grains and all that sort of stuff you know yeah. so so there's there's certainly 
there's certainly more scope in making more products, but I think the quality or the grain structures mm. of bats will be going down a little bit. Okay. Essentially a grade, a top end grade one, it's just impossible now because of how the trees are felled and how quickly they're felled to have tight grains like they used to maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of the wood is, is farmed. Generally it's put by uh, either in a wetland or by a, by a river. So sometimes the wood, if it's more more hydration the tree gets, the faster it will grow. So once it gets up to a 42 inch circumference, then it will be up to size. And if it's if it's grown within 14 years, you can imagine how wide those those grains will be. So gone are the days. You know, you used to you know speak to JS Wrights and they'd have a farmer that's got like a hundred year old oak tree that's mm. you know as wide as a house, and it'd be very slow growing, and they'd get huge amount of very fine grain, you know, lovely looking bats. So yeah, it's um it's not gonna, it's not certainly not going to be a problem. Um, but I think it's something I've want, I've want, maybe wanted to do a talk about previously, but it, it's I think it's more of an education thing with the consumer. Hmm. because from our from our willow supplier we can basically buy a grade one cleft of wood which are really expensive now but that cleft of wood can have seven grains in yeah as long as it's clean as long as they're straight but that seven grains at 100 a cleft of wood is 130 millimeters wide hmm. if it's got seven grains in it we're taking off 20 mil obviously a bat is 108 mil wide so you're fundamentally taking 22 mil off you're going to lose at least one potentially two so we could be buying a grade one cleft of wood for a lot of money yeah and we could potentially machine it down and it'll have five grains in and then you can't really sell that as a grade one technically could you if if it performs really really well then we would have no issue with putting it right into some of our top levels yeah but as i said the expectation is to have you know people talk about 10 grains you know the problem with the cricket industry also is the fact that it's very ambiguous. So some people's grade one will be very different to somebody else's grade one. You know, we um, we do try and keep our top end bats at least six grains plus. And yeah. then once you're into the 40 clover and even the platinum, we sh- certainly eight to ten, you know, nice and clean. Yeah. And some of them will have little blemishes and stuff in. But it's important that the, the performance is that's paramount to us. I think visuals after that. Yeah. And that's what we try and do it as well with anyone who walks in wanting to buy a cricket bat the first and foremost thing is performance weight balance, balance yeah. then looks yeah within whatever their budget is agree uh, and that, yeah. that really long term that's the way to go yeah because uh, then they'll enjoy using the bat and if they purely go on looks and it doesn't perform that well yeah then they'll you know they just won't enjoy using the bat as much yeah. and that perf- the look side of things will last a very short it's a very short term way to buy a cricket bat whereas yeah. if you focus purely on performance and the balance and the weight that's what we try and do and i think there needs to be education yeah in the market uh because traditionally it's always been number of grains more grains the better but that's just not the case yeah so yeah that's that's very interesting obviously the other major uh, issue or limitation you have as a brand is English Willow is, as the name suggests, made or grown in England yeah. only, really. And even even then, it's only certain parts of England. It's not everywhere in England. Yeah. How do you see, you know, in terms of sustainability and the demand increasing, how do you see that going over the next few years? I mean, JS Wrights have got a good um, planting program. Mm-hmm. So for every every tree they fell... They always say that they plant at least two, okay. um, which which should mean the longevity is is, is safe. Um, and we also do have a planting program ourselves as well, which we've been doing for the last five years. Mm. So we now have around it's around six hundred trees in the ground. So we do about one hundred and twenty five every year. So that is not something that we want to rely upon because we've obviously got probably another 10 years before we fell the first one and process that. I think with JS Wrights and the other two, three willow suppliers that you do have in this country, I think it's pretty safe. There is There, there has been some, some European willow on the market, but we, we did test 12 clefts and we instantly put a full stop on it because we'd, we'd never ever use, I think it's from Serbia or European. Why would you not use because it just it completely collapses so so we've we've manufactured the bat we pressed it 
as we would normally do. We we do a very sensible press. We don't press too soft. We don't press too hard. There's also a misconception that if you press really soft, you've got a good bat, and that isn't the case. We just press sensibly, and we try to do that with the um, European Willow when we've tested them, and you you hit one ball and the whole face does sort of collapse. Mm. It's almost like it's just made of, you know, layers of very thin paper all the way through. So as soon as you hit a ball, it just it just folds up. And it's you, very brittle. Yeah, I think brittle, yeah. It doesn't seem to have that linear strength that, that Willow has. So yeah, we yeah, we would never never make anything out of European Willow. Unless you wanna you know, we could potentially look at softball bats where they where they're not having the um that level of impact you could potentially work on there but i don't think it's um worth jeopardizing 25 years of a brand's reputation to use something that's moderately cheaper the serbian willow is 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 cheaper but i just don't think it's worth taking that risk so just looking forward what do you see as the importance of being a specialist in a world now dominated and increasingly dominated by online giants like Amazon and so forth. In my opinion, there will always be a place for niche specialists, whether it's in the cricket industry or any industry. But what do you think? I mean, I, I don't understand how the big online retailers operate like Amazon because, you know, it's it's quite a service-heavy industry. You know, bats are, in their nature, problematic. It's a wooden, wooden product. So, I mean, my opinion is the fact that the big online Amazons and stuff I don't really it's not a very pleasant way of purchasing a product is it I think and I've seen it with with online stores being successful and footfall increasing I think probably six years ago it was moving heavily online but I think it's coming back into store and for an inanimate object I think people just love coming in and touching and and feeling it it is a touchy feely product so so to to come into AJ Sports it's it's just a lovely experience and and it should be there are so many things that you buy that aren't about the experience in a brown envelope you know brown package arrives at your front door you know it's not a it's not a lovely way to do it so coming in store feeling it speaking to a good member of staff with the with the knowledge that people have at aj yeah what what can be nicer take your time pick one out that you like and if you do have a problem with it you know there's a you can walk straight back into the shop and you know speak to the person in there and they can explain what you need to do or what you've done wrong or you know and it's it's a project product that can last for 10 years more yeah. so you should have a relationship with a shop you know you should know the know the person there and come back in and build a relationship and they'll look after you and what does the future hold for you daniel swain <laughs> looking forward obviously you have chase yeah how do you see yourself moving forward from it so so we've we've got some new plans that we've kind of had on the back burner for the last couple of years we are going to be expanding the workshop so it's at the moment we we have about 1900 square foot and we're moving into a a new building which is about 4000 square feet so i don't want to expand exponentially but i think we should be able to double our production and still keep it very personable and not just to be i'd say mass production you know we we are a bespoke company and we do you know very much like gunnamore you know gunnamore are seen as a massive brand which they are massive manufacturer brand but their due diligence for every single one of their products is fantastic and they hand make their bats in nottingham as well so you know why why could we not be similar-ish to them you know we're we're never going to get up to their scale but so i just want to keep it real i want to just keep the same processes the same ethics don't we don't have a huge amount of product so we can keep it refined but just scale it up a fraction more keep good relationships with retailers you know the retailers are our bread and butter so you know keep our relationships with our retailers so just scale up and you know we'll employ a few more bat makers and hopefully keep that keep that experience and knowledge going through a few generations more hopefully well Thank you very much, Dan, for coming in today. It's been a fascinating insight into the world of an MOD engineer turned bat maker. Thank you so much. No pleasure. Good uh, Good to chat to you. Brilliant.